Yes. We got about two minutes left. All right. Everybody, welcome back to Community Conversations. This is part two of our show. We're speaking with Mr. Sam Lind. He is the CEO of NEA Baptist Hospital here in Jonesboro. And we're going to just talk about everything that the hospital is doing to keep the community safe from COVID-19. So we're going to officially kick this off in about, about a minute before we go live on the radio. But if you are watching on our Facebook live feed, go ahead and share this video so that you can get this important information to all of those in the community. Because we want to make sure that everyone stays informed and that everyone stays safe. So one question I can ask you now, and then I'll ask you again once we officially go live. Um, sure. What is your current um, capacity right now? You're starting to hear reports of hospitals possibly getting overwhelmed. How are you guys um, handling the influx of cases? Yeah, we've got a high census today than, than where we might normally run pre-pandemic, uh, but certainly uh, continue to have capacity to increase. We, we're definitely busy. Our staff, uh, you know, are tired, I think, like everybody else uh, after six months of of COVID, uh, but we continue to pl make plans and, and draw resources in to continue to scale up. So in terms of capacity for caring for more patients, we're in pretty good shape right now. That's definitely good to hear that. Cause I know, you know, I think the worst thing that could possibly happen is, you know, what that you get it and you show up at the hospital and you get told, well, we don't just have any room for you. Sure. Yeah. I think that's, that is a, a large concern and, uh, I think, you know, when we talk about flattening the curve, it's really two purposes. One, uh, you know, by doing that, you're also hopefully keeping people from getting infected, uh, but also then kind of flattening the demand curve uh, for the need for healthcare services. So not everybody needs everything at, at the same time. Uh, and I think we've seen periods where we've done a good job of that. And then you've seen the last couple of weeks, which we've spoken on uh, very publicly, where We've seen hospitalizations uh, increase by over 100%. Uh, and that trend uh, is going in the wrong direction if, if two of those things are our goals, which are you know, reducing demand for healthcare all at the same time and uh, continued growing number of infections. Absolutely. All right, we are inside of the weather and we'll have the local news, well actually, more national and state news. And then we will actually go live on the radio. I'm just kind of sharing this right now with some of the groups that follow us so that they can tune in as well. And of course, for those of you watching on our Facebook Live, post your questions and comments on the live feed. You're actually talking with the, we're actually going to talk with the CEO of NEA Baptist Hospital. So any questions that you may want to ask them on what they're doing for COVID-19, this is your opportunity to ask. So stand by, we'll be going live on the radio. Any questions that you may want to ask them on I'm listening. what they're doing for COVID-19? This is your opportunity to come yeah, ask them. So stand by, we'll be going live. Any questions that you may want to ask them Can't forget one 2.5 FM. And we are back on Community Conversations. This is a special part two of our series. And speaking with us right now is Mr. Sam Land. He is the CEO of NEA Baptist here in Jonesboro. And we're just going to talk about all of the things that NEA Baptist is doing to help combat COVID-19. And plus the NEA Charitable Foundation. Actually, they have a lot of things going on in the, that help the community. So we're going to just learn all about them. So uh, Mr. Land, if you could just kind of maybe as we are, we'll just kind of start off maybe telling the listeners just a little bit about yourself and your background. Sure. Yeah. So thank you for having me, Leganzi. I appreciate uh, being with you this morning. Uh, as you said, I'm the, the CEO here at NEA Baptist. NEA Baptist has uh, a lot of different components, as you've alluded to, one of those being the hospital, but also, you know, 16 other locations where we serve outpatients across Northeast Arkansas. 
as well as a number of, of different entities within our charitable foundation that are uh, serving patients and families uh, at no cost. And so uh, we're excited about uh, what it means to bring those services uh, to a community that needs it. Um, and certainly privileged to be a, a small part of the team here. My background uh, is what you might call a traditional uh, healthcare administrator background. I'm originally from Memphis, grew up there in the Hickory Hill area. Uh, I moved on uh, to Alabama for school and graduate school and came back to my hometown to work for Baptist, who I've worked with for almost 10 years now. Uh, at four of our different uh, facilities. Uh, Jonesboro was actually the second place that I worked back in 2013 uh, before I got transferred to a couple of other uh, areas and then came back to NEA Baptist in April. So it's been about six months. And as you, as you can guess, a, a little bit of a wild transition in the midst of everything going on in our world, uh, but privileged to work with a really good team here uh, every day that, that really focuses on uh, delivering care to their their neighbors and people in their congregation and their families. So I'm proud of them and uh, proud of the work we do. All right, so the way that we got in touch with you is uh, you along with the CEO of St. Bernard's hosted a press conference talking about COVID-19 due to the rising numbers here in Cricket County that was concerned. In fact, it was so much concern that even the uh, president's task force actually called out Craighead County um, to take action. So for those who may have missed that press conference, just kind of talk about where we are in this community with COVID-19 and also what NEA Baptist Hospital is doing to fight the virus and how are things going with like treating the virus? Sure. Yeah, I appreciate that. So, uh, you know, everybody's watching uh, numbers and statistics these days, uh, and it certainly uh, will drain you trying to track all the numbers and the changes in data. Uh, but anytime there's a new uh, disease and we're trying to learn how to treat it and track it, uh, we're all learning new lessons every day, usually every hour. Uh, and so what we've seen here in Northeast Arkansas is a sharp increase in the number of cases that are being identified, but more concerningly, a sharp increase in hospitalizations. And so over uh, about a month's period, we've seen well over 100% increase in hospitalized COVID-19 cases uh, which is a, a real cause for concern. In addition to that, we've seen uh, our outpatient cases in our clinics uh, increase uh, quite a bit. So in the very beginning of the pandemic, we were seeing less than 6% positive rate in our clinic settings. Uh, those are our outpatient settings across the region. Today, we're seeing uh, up in, in the realm of 20%. We've seen days as high as 27% of patients uh, coming in, getting tested for COVID, testing positive. So amongst all the cold and flu and allergy symptoms people get tested for, uh, you know, out of concern, we're seeing a, a much larger increase in the number of those that are actually positive for COVID-19. And so we thought it was important to get together and sort of have a unified message. We all know there's news from all kinds of different sources about what, uh, you know, what COVID-19 is doing in our communities, how it's affecting patients. And so we thought it was important for, uh, you know, the healthcare community in this region to come together and try to deliver a unified message that yes, there is cause for concern uh, as cases increase. It really is truly affecting people in our community. It's affecting patients very clearly uh, and their families. Uh, and we also know it's affecting our local businesses uh, and certainly our healthcare workers as well. So our, our healthcare workers are working extra shifts and overtime uh, and everyone's tired of quarantine. Everyone's tired of, uh, of the lifestyle changes that have had to be made for this pandemic. And that's no different than the healthcare workers that still come into work every day uh, to try to do the right thing and, and care for their community. So th that was really the purpose of the message and encouraging people, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago before Halloween and now as we approach Thanksgiving to really try to be smart and think about um, doing the right thing to, to protect themselves and protect their loved ones uh, from increased spread. All right, let's go to Kubilev with our next question. Okay. Um, <laughs> if you could just give the community one message right now, um, what would you say to them as far as when it comes to how this disease is spread 
Um, and then what precautions we really realistically need to be taking right now? <laughs> sure. Uh, I think that's a great question. And so uh, my message uh, in a short, simple way would be sort of the same things that everybody's tired of hearing, right? And, and that's uh, social distance when you're able. Uh, and when you're not, take all the other precautions that we talk about. So masks, um, washing of hands frequently. Uh, and I know we're all tired of hearing those things, but I'll, I'll give you an example of, of why we keep saying that. About two months into the pandemic, so early May, I guess it was, uh, our, we had been taking care of a number of COVID patients. And as you can imagine, it takes a whole host of people to do that. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that the things that we had put in place to protect people were working. And so out of our over 2,000 employees, we tested about 1,700 people to see if we had any, uh, any spread within our own building and within our own healthcare workforce here. And out of those 1,700 people tested, we had less than 10 test positive. So less than half of a percent of our employees after caring for patients with COVID for two months contracted the disease. And that was at a time when people were really doing a good job of using masks, uh, keeping a good distance from each other, being really good about washing their hands. And when they couldn't wash their hands, they had hand sanitizer within an arm's reach at all times or carried some in their pocket or in their cars. And so... You know, that testing from a scientific standpoint told us that our model was working. Uh, and I think when we get away from those things is when we see the increases, uh, whether that's in small group settings or large group settings. And so I think we've got to continue to be disciplined. Uh, and that's harder to, harder to do than it is to say, I understand, but continue to be disciplined about uh, limiting the number of gatherings, limiting exposure and, and, and continuing on the social distancing the use of masks, uh, and hand hygiene, certainly. Now, what do you think about the politicalization of masks? And obviously you're taking it from a health um, care professional standpoint, but you know, you, just, you have some people that believe that, uh, you know, it's their right not to wear a mask that they're trying to be, that it's an infringement on their, on their rights. And even people who just don't believe that you know, the virus exists at all. Um, so you're having a communication issue with the public. You know, you have some people in the public who just, you know, does not believe the message that you're putting out there. So what is like your marketing department trying to do to combat that? That's a great question. And I, and I think, um, you know, that's a tough one to answer. Uh, unfortunately, people can twist all kinds of information into whatever message they want to get out for whatever their own personal agenda may be. And it's unfortunate, uh, certainly on both sides of the equation. I, I wish that I could, you know, march uh, camera crews or the community through my ICU so they can see the true effects this is having on patients, uh, families, and the healthcare workers taking care of these COVID-19 positive patients. Um, but out of respect and, and privacy, we, we're not going to do that, obviously. So what we focused on doing is trying to be a little bit uh, more transparent than maybe we normally would be just in regards to what our numbers look like. Uh, and so, you know, we're sharing on our Facebook um, on Fridays what our patient census looks like from a COVID standpoint, how many patients that we're treating in the hospital, how many uh, you know, what percentage of patients have tested positive in the community that we've taken care of that week uh, and trying to trying to paint that picture for folks to understand. I, you know, I think anybody that uh, has any any domain knowledge about research or scientific research in particular knows that you can make a study, you can craft data to say whatever you want, and you can certainly poke holes in just about anything. Uh, but you know, when you see the faces of the people that are experiencing this firsthand, it's important to try to continue to be steadfast and share, sharing and spreading the message uh, and trying to be as transparent as you can to try to let people know this is a very real thing and it's having a very real impact uh, on all of us, whether we know someone personally that's been infected uh, or whether it's uh, a small business owner in our community, we're, we're all uh, being affected in some way, our community is being affected and we all have a, have a role to play. Now, you yeah. mentioned early, oh, go ahead, Q. No, I just want to ask real quick. Um, I took statistics since I'm, 
I'm familiar with how information can be skewed to benefit the the sender of the information. Are there any reputable sites where people can find sources that are in alignment with what's what the reality is? Well, I, I think you know early on everybody kind of pointed to the the Johns Hopkins um, websites and and the CDC websites that were tracking data and. And as you know, people people can poke holes in that because there's going to be certainly errors, um, you know, errors in every data set exist. And so if we focus in on those small errors, uh, you know, there's there's going to be people that really try to tout that as the summary of the whole uh, study or the whole data set. Um, for for us here at NEA Baptist, you know, we're, we're tracking our own data. Uh, and, and what we know and see every day. So we're looking at facts, right? And, and that's what we're interested in. And so I think that, you know, when I look on a national scale, uh, I'm looking at data from the Arkansas Hospital Association. Uh, I'll compare us sometimes to the Tennessee Hospital Association just to see what community trends look like. Um, and so those are the hard numbers that I, that I try to focus on in regards to what we're seeing happening right in front of us in addition to, to the hard data. So, you know, I, I'd encourage you to keep an eye on the NEA Baptist Facebook page as we try to keep our information out there. Like Leganzi said, our, our marketing team does a great job of, of getting that information out. Uh, and certainly, uh, you know, if people have questions or suggestions for what would be helpful, we, we want to be a good community partner. Okay, now I want to ask this question. You mentioned earlier about that you say you wish you could take people through your ICU and for, and for HIPAA laws and other reasons, obviously you can't, but without you know naming names or going into detail, just kind of tell some of the things that you do see um, in the ICU where these patients are getting treated. Yeah, Leganzi, I mentioned that you know with every new, uh, new disease, um, there's certainly new research coming out frequently. And so one of the, the scary things is that we don't have a surefire way to treat COVID-19 yet. And the reason for that uh, is because it affects everybody differently. And so early on in the pandemic, everybody was very fearful. If you had any comorbidities, if you were sick with different uh, other diseases or battling chronic illness, that you were, you know, uh, had much higher risk of a poor outcome if you contracted COVID-19. Uh, more and more as the disease spreads, we see that that's not always the case. Um, some people that are very healthy do very poorly. Uh, and certainly some people that are battling chronic illness do better than others, and regardless of age uh, or any other factor. And so while you can take the data and zone in on who the, the high risk populations are, uh, there's certainly still uh, concerns about, um, you know, what would happen if you or I contracted the disease. And some of that's, uh, you know, a big question mark in, until it happens. And hopefully it doesn't, obviously. In the ICU setting, uh, we're seeing just that. We're seeing a wide range of patients with different health backgrounds. Uh, and we're using a host of a number of treatment options uh, to try to drive outcomes. I think one of the things that we would like to see as a nation, of course, everybody wants to see an effective vaccine, uh, but there's other treatments. So we know the president was a recipient of uh, a somewhat experimental drug early on and after his diagnosis. Uh, those are not available for outpatients today. Uh, and, and Regeneron, as an example, is not even available to our inpatients today. And so we need to try to continue to get our hands on effective therapeutics that can have a positive impact. Uh, until then, you know, we're, we're using the cards we're dealt. So whether that's remdesivir, which is another big one where we, you know, people, different studies have said different things. Uh, some people want to talk about hydroxychloroquine, which has also been politicized to your point, um, you know, in the use of steroids and things like that. So, so we're, we're doing a whole host of things and as you can imagine, we're treating people that each have individual stories and individual conditions. Uh, no two people are the same. And, and that's very much true of what we're seeing in our ICUs 
uh, that our nurses and other team members are, are fighting every day to try to take care of. All right, let's go to Kubila. I am just basically taking listening, it out, taking in. Um, but I guess I just have a question. What do you say to people who really have a dismissive attitude about this um, disease, this virus? Um, I have been personally self isolating uh, due to my own health concerns and. I don't know. I'm just, I'm not fearful of going out. I'm concerned because there are those that are not taking it as serious. Um, there are some people who say it's just maybe an amped up version of the flu. You know, there's a lot of different discussions about it, but what do you have to say for those people that are just super dismissive? That's a great question. And, and I think, um, you know, there's certainly we've seen at this point that there's people it doesn't matter what you tell them, right? That, that they're going to have the opinion that they have and and we can flaunt all kinds of data all day. And there's lots of other data sources out there that'll be there to try to refute any point we make. Um, you know, what I would say is that, you know, COVID continues to, ha to spread in our community. Um, you know, and, and I think if you talk to anybody uh, and there's, you know, what, over 5,000 people that work for the two major healthcare institutions within Jonesboro. Um, all of those folks can speak at some level, hopefully, to, to what their institution uh, is faced with. Uh, and so I would encourage people, instead of reading Facebook or Twitter, maybe, to, to talk to some local people that are on the front lines of this. Um, you know, there's, there's, nurses, respiratory therapists, even housekeepers across our community that are working very, very hard every day um, to care for the patients that are affected by this. And so those are really the best sources of truth for what's happening in our community relative to this disease. I, I don't know any better source of truth than that. Speaking with Sam Lance, CEO of NEA Baptist Hospital here in Jones. We're talking about COVID-19 and all things NEA Baptist. I want to say good morning to Yesenia Hernandez Lovo, Yoshana, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correct, Duran, Susan Wiley Harris, Kristen Nichols, Pam Edwards, Donna Watkins, and our own Nadine Coleman. Appreciate each and every one of you for checking out our live feed. And of course, if you have any questions for Sam, go ahead and post them in the comments and we will ask them to him. So I want to just quickly ask this as we about have about a minute and a half left in this segment. You mentioned about some of the experimental treatments that President Trump got when he contracted COVID-19. Um, have you heard on any word when your hospital or other hospitals locally may be able to get those same treatments? No, we don't have any receipt date of, uh, of anything additional at this time that I'm aware of. I, I think that, um, you know, until we have a, a shipment date, uh, you really can't, can't bank on any of that. Um, certainly there's, you know, you've heard over the weekend, there's multiple major drug companies working on various treatments and vaccines. Uh, and while we hear different projections every day of when we might receive some of those or how those studies are going until it's in our hands, uh, you really don't know. And so, you know, we continue to, to use what's in front of us and the tools that we have in our toolkit uh, to try to treat people best we can. Well, then we definitely applaud all the hard work you all are doing to treat each and every person. Of course, we, it's our prayer that, you know, nobody would get it and that your services wouldn't even be necessary, but that's not the world that we live in. So we have to do what we can to beat this virus together. Getting ready to go into our first break. The conversation does continue on our Facebook Live, but for those listening on the radio, we are going to take a quick one minute break and we'll be back with more. This is Community Conversations on KLEK or 2.5 FM. All right, so we're still live on Facebook and I see another one of our faithful KLEK supporters, Derek Coleman, is on our live feed. Good morning, Derek. And feel free to post a question. So, uh, one thing, when we come back from the other side of the break, we can kind of talk about 
the vaccine and people's attitudes towards vaccines and even maybe going a little bit into the change of administrations on the uh, presidency and how that's going to affect um, how the whole coronavirus is being treated and the outlook towards that. So got about 30 seconds. Q, are you, I know Q, you, you had mentioned me properly that you may have to go to, are you gonna, you wanna jump off now? Are you gonna go ahead and stay for the second segment or? I'll hang around as long as I can. Um, Derek Coleman sent a message um, about a discussion about the freedom. I'm gonna have to listen to it again or send it to you. There's something that's gonna be discussed today at five. Where, where about at? It's time for the rejoin. I know what you're talking about though. And we're back on community conversations on KLK 102.5 with our guest Sam Lynn, the CEO of NEA Baptist Hospital. And of course you can post your questions and your comments on our live feed. So now I kind of want to transition into vaccines. As you mentioned before we went to break, there are several vaccines that are being tested. So just kind of talk a little bit about um, how those are going, because I'm sure it's something that you're staying on top of. Yeah, we're, you know, I think anybody on social media can see there's been uh, a number of studies being done by a number of different companies. Uh, Pfizer, I think, was the big name over the weekend. Last week, you heard some about AstraZeneca, both major uh, pharmaceutical companies uh, working very hard at getting a vaccine together. Uh, you know, they're at various stages and, and still need approval for distribution. Uh, but early results have sounded as though they're very positive, uh, albeit at a very small scale. So I think there's a lot of questions still there. But what I can say for NEA Baptist is that we're working through uh, a number of things to be prepared um, to, to receive those when we do. Uh, those will almost certainly be on an allocation basis uh, to certain hubs within various regions. Uh, and so you know, we, we've got to be prepared to, A, receive those and store those. We're working through a number of things to be able to do that when that day comes. Uh, and also we're working through what it looks like to distribute those. So almost certainly uh, you can imagine that those would go to uh, certain groups first, uh, whether that be healthcare workers or first responders, um, teachers, uh, and then roll out to the general public is generally what what's been discussed so far. We'll participate in a roundtable exercise this week uh, with a number of other hospitals working through uh, what it would look like to receive and distribute and different models to do that. Uh, and so there's a lot of work going on and, and you're right, there uh, seems to be progress um, and kind of like the other therapeutics that I mentioned, until we have them in hand, it's hard to say uh, when that day will be and, and how we'll be able to get them out in the timeline for that. But we're working towards that quickly and we'll be ready. Okay. So keeping along the lines of talking about vaccines, obviously there are people who are skeptical of the vaccine. You have some people that are skeptical because it's of the time frame instead of the normal years that it takes to development. You know, by no other choice, it's taking months to. So there's people that are concerned that it may not truly be ready and that it may be side effects that weren't anticipated during the trials. And then as we kind of talked earlier, you know, you just have those who just believe that it's a whole big conspiracy in the first place. So how do you address, well, I guess with the second group, as you said earlier, people are gonna believe what they're gonna believe. But for those who are skeptical because they feel it may be unproven that they may want to take it, but they said, well, let me wait and see how it, if it affects it, how it affects other people before I take mine. Yeah, I think that's a fair question, right? I mean, I, I think people um, should think about that before they take any drug or therapeutic. Um, certainly, you know, we've got drugs on the market today. You hear commercials every weekend, right? You hear at the end of every drug commercial, they list off 20 seconds worth of disclaimers. Uh, and so I, I think you got to scrutinize a little bit, um, you know, ask questions of your physician and and providers, um, you know, what are the effects of any kind of therapeutic? I think for the vaccines, uh, you know, some of that has yet to be seen as it works through its FDA approval process. And I think it's unfortunate that 
the FDA has been drug into the political mud along with every other rhetoric that we've seen. Uh, but the FDA truly, uh, you know, being a non-political organization, tries to work on behalf of the American people and, and keep us safe. And so when the day comes that, that we have uh, a vaccine that, you know, independent studies say is effective, I think, um, you know, the, the best thing will be to to work towards getting that to as many people as possible, uh, essentially, and especially those that are high risk uh, in order to, to protect them. And another concern about the vaccine is the potential cost. Will NEA Baptist Hospital take steps to make sure that even those that can't afford it will still be able to get the vaccine? Yeah, absolutely. So, so part A of my answer to that question would be that it also kind of remains to be seen if the government's going to front the bill for that vaccine. Uh, we've received some information that indicates that uh, at least for uh, the first few batches that it may be of no cost to, to any Baptist and of course to our patients as a result of that. Uh, you know, we would be administering those drugs at, um, you know, at no cost. Uh, and so, you know, paying the bill for the administering and the workforce to do that on our own, and we're happy to do that. Part B of that answer, Laganzi, would really be about, uh, you know, ensuring as, as it continues, ensuring that people uh, with, uh, you know, maybe less means than others can get access to that vaccine. It, it's really no different than any other healthcare services that we, um, you know, that we do as a result of being a, a not-for-profit healthcare system. So, uh, you know, we, we issue millions and millions of dollars of free care every year. Um, and that's part of who we are and part of our mission. And, and we'll certainly uphold that in the case of COVID-19 vaccines as well. All right. So let's transition just for a little bit, since you mentioned about the, the foundation, the nonprofit foundation, how it gives out millions of dollars of free health care. Talk about that a little bit because uh, some of our listeners and viewers may not know, as you mentioned, they may be of low means and may not can afford traditional health care. So we definitely want them to be aware of that resource being available to them. Yeah, sure. So, uh, so I think a couple of things that I would mention. One, uh, you know, NEA Baptist as a whole, not just the foundation, is actually a not-for-profit institution. So meaning that any profits that are made as a result of the work that's done here, uh, that money is injected back into the healthcare system to, you know, buy uh, technology that will help um, deliver better care to hire staff or fund programs uh, that benefit our community and the ability to deliver good healthcare. So uh, NEA Baptist as a whole, as a not-for-profit institution also has uh, the responsibility um, to make contributions to our community for what we deliver. And so we do that uh, by offering, uh, you know, very discounted or even free care for those that fall into certain brackets. Uh, there's an application process for that. Um, that's simply working through what um, generally tax returns show as your income and then, you know, working through a discount scale to do that um, and, and a, a get those services at a reduced rate. You mentioned uh, the NEA Baptist Charitable Foundation, which uh, is a entity that supports a number of, um, a number of things uh, that uh, provides free services to the community. So there's a medication assistance fund, which is probably one that makes the most sense to people. Uh, as we all know, drug costs can be exorbitantly high. So the medication assistance fund helps people to obtain medication uh, with a goal of trying to keep them out of the hospital and keep them healthy. Uh, we've got other programs that support uh, various missions. So one that I'm very, very proud of is our Center for Good Grief. Uh, and so the NEA Baptist Center for Good Grief focuses on uh, counseling services for uh, family members, or I shouldn't even say family members, loved ones who have lost someone in their lives. Uh, and so they focus on delivering uh, the message that, that grief is big and it's hard and it's okay. Uh, and so those folks work every day to try to help people on their grief journey uh, at absolutely no cost. And there's a number of, of people and institutions in our community that have taken advantage of that service. Uh, and that team does really great work. So those are just a couple of examples of, 
of why you may see NEA Baptist raising money. Uh, it's to help support those missions uh, where we're able to deliver services uh, at low or no cost. Michael Beaver, did you want to weigh in on any questions, or, excuse me, comments about uh, what Sam has uh, talked about? Um, not necessarily, but just want to just say that I do understand everyone's concern about vaccines. One, because I, you know, have read some studies where it takes years to develop a suitable vaccine. And I know vaccines are not guaranteed, even after many, many years of studying and testing. Um, what do you have to say to people who are concerned, you know, that this is just this is just too soon. It's been less than a year, and this virus is brand new to us. And so, has there even been enough testing on the virus to learn how it actually mutates? Um, just like there are many strains of the flu virus, mm -hmm. you know, there could be many strains of COVID. <laughs> I mean, there are many strains of COVID. This particular one, COVID nineteen, you know, it could potentially mutate within several months. Yeah, that's a good point. So, so from the frame of the example that you just provided, so the, the flu vaccine, as we all know, it's not a flu vaccine that sits, uh, that we produce the same way every year that sits in a refrigerator, uh, any leftovers wait until the next year. You know, there's, there's new strains of evolving flu every year. And so as the flu vaccine is developed within a 12 month period or less to be prepared for the next flu season, uh, is kind of the same way that I think about COVID-19. So, so you're right in that we're already hearing and seeing reports of uh, mutations in COVID-19, particularly in other countries. Uh, and certainly the flu, the, excuse me, the COVID-19 vaccines that come out, you can almost uh, be assured that it will be based on a particular strain that may look very different. That's very possible. Uh, but that's not to say that, that it's ineffective, right? So same thing, same thing as the flu, it'll, it'll battle what we hope will be the largest swath of existing COVID-19 strains. Uh, and then subsequent vaccinations being developed would have to focus on uh, any mutations that were to occur. Uh, but, and you're right, there's a lot of vaccines that have taken a long many years uh, to develop. Uh, but I think based on its similarities and structure with other viruses that perhaps we can have some faith that, that the COVID-19 virus uh, vaccine will actually be effective for the largest strain of COVID-19 that we've been battling over the last six months. Got some new Facebook shout out. Shout out to Sandra Newsom, Vicki Lewis, big KLK watcher, and shout out to Diego Ranch. She definitely works hard to push the cause of Diego Ranch. Kelly M. Lewis Taylor and Vanessa Bird. Appreciate each and every one of you for checking in on our Facebook live feed. So we are getting ready for a new change in administration, an incoming president, which will mean a shift in the attitude and how COVID-19 is addressed on the national level. Um, of course, you've seen the news that uh, President-elect Biden has already named his task force that is going to start working on this once he takes office. So what do you foresee as far as like the change in administration and how NEA will respond to the change in how the federal government responds to the virus? Well, uh, that's a good question. And I think uh, obviously it, it remains to be seen how um, that transition goes and sort of who steps in uh, to the different roles that have been playing a key part in various agencies that are working on pieces of COVID-19 battles. Um, you know, I, I think what'll be interesting to see is if we are able to uh, mobilize resources in a different way than has been done in the past. So certainly uh, you've heard calls for uh, using existing manufacturing to provide more, uh, produce and provide more PPE. Um, that's, you know, probably the most simple example to think about uh, in terms of what might be a, a change if COVID cases were to increase such that the country was overwhelmed, uh, similar to what we saw in New York in the early stages. Uh, and so for NEA Baptist, you know, our, our 
our you know mission is pretty steadfast. Um, I'd say we've been pretty uh, well taken care of by our parent company in terms of our our supply resources, uh, and and that was the one that really probably the federal government can help the most with. Uh, and the state government's done a good job of, of trying to work with them on that. Our, our uh, Department of Health and the Arkansas Hospital Association work on our behalf to try to try to help with those things. You know, but there's other things that the federal and state governments can't help with and things like the space that we have uh, to care for patients in that, that, while not exactly fixed, is not something that any government agency is going to be able to help us with. Uh, and you can say the same thing about staff as well. And so. We continue to take ownership and responsibility for those things. Uh, and so throughout this whole pandemic, we have not laid off a single person. We haven't furloughed a single person. Uh, we've kept our staff here. We've kept them working. And as we've seen cases increase, we've been able to benefit from that. And we've also continued to hire. We continue to hire doctors. We continue to hire nurses and, and staff in other disciplines um, that continue to support us. So, you know, I, I think a change in administration will certainly, uh, we'll see a change in some rhetoric. Uh, and could certainly see some minor changes, uh, probably in policy and resource allocation. But some of that's up to ourselves, too. And so we continue to fight that battle, uh, regardless of, of who claims to be in charge. So you would overall say that NEA Baptist has a pretty good um, working relationship um, with Governor Hutchinson's office. Yeah, I, I think the governor's office ha has done what they can to try to support us. You know, I. I I don't envy trying to sort through um, all the different information at that level. Uh, like I said, we get to deal in fact without a lot of politics here at NEA Baptist and, and we see our numbers every day and, and we're ordering, you know, a hard number of supplies and we're hiring staff and able to affect things without a lot of outside noise all the time. Uh, and so we've got good relationships uh, with the State Department of Health. We've got good relationships with the Arkansas Hospital Association. Uh, we've got good relationships with the other hospitals in our region uh, and, and nearby regions. Uh, and so those are really the things that have benefited us the most, alongside being part of a, of a healthcare system with 22 hospitals that, um, you know, sister hospitals that we can work with and collaborate with to, to figure out how to battle this thing, regardless of any message uh, other people might be trying to trying to spread. Okay, hey, um, we did get a question from our one of our listeners, and he wanted to get your thoughts on the freedom resolution that is going to be presented to the Craig A. County Quorum Court. For those of you who may not be f familiar, this act resolution was actually brought to the Jonesboro City Council. It died for lack of a second um, in the committee meeting before it reached the council. But basically, it, it's calling for more legislative control. Uh, over COVID decisions as opposed to the uh, mandates that the governor and Arkansas Department of Health have called for. Um, some people call this freedom resolution an anti-mask mandate, um, but just what are your thoughts on it overall? Yeah, I, I think that there's, you know, we continue to hear messages about, um, like we talked about early on, uh, people wanting to, to make politics the center of this discussion, uh, whereas we really should be talking about people and patients and folks whose health is really being affected here. Um, you know, an anti-mask mandate does not line up with any science that I've seen or, uh, you know, the science that I'm seeing every day within my own building um, is what I would have to say about that. All right. So getting into my next, getting into my next question, what if, for some reason, there is such a surge of COVID-19 patients that the hospital is overwhelmed? What steps would you all take then? Would you all set up tents outside or triad units? Or what, how exactly would that work? Yeah, that's a good question. So that's something we've been working on, uh, you know, for the last six months, obviously, and it, it evolves and changes every day, just like everything else. Um, but you know, we continue to focus on what, what I call the three S's of the surge plan, uh, which is staffing, supply, and space, which are all things that, that I mentioned uh, previously, you know, and so we continue to try to scale those things appropriately. We've got some good news. A, like I mentioned, we're, we're part of a large healthcare corporation, uh, which helps us with buying power for supply. Uh, just a couple months ago, 
we had a, a shipment of gowns that was stuck in customs. Uh, and because our parent corporation, uh, you know, being part of a parent corporation that advocates for us, they were able to charter a FedEx plane to go fly and pick those up and bring them home to us. Uh, and so from a supply standpoint, we've been taken care of. So that's one piece of it. The next part uh, is the, the staffing piece, which I mentioned, we continue to, to uh, hire and grow our workforce. Uh, but we also are benef benefited by the fact that we're not just a hospital. We also have multiple uh, clinic locations. One, uh, our large multidisciplinary clinic on site in the same building as the hospital, but also the other 16 sites that we have across the region and we have healthcare professionals staffing that, those locations, obviously, that we can pull on in times of need, uh, if necessary, to help us scale up our ability to care for more patients. The last part of that is space. And so from a space perspective, uh, you would think that would be a little more fixed, and it is in terms of hospital rooms available, but there's other non-traditional care settings that we could use as well. So obviously, we have emergency rooms that we don't typically count in our inpatient census availability. Uh, we've got rooms that we use for pre and post surgery that we could use. Uh, and then if it came down to it, you know, we could go to an old ward style management where we've got, you know, our, our conference center where we can. Yeah, I'm sorry, we're going to have to leave there. We're going to get ready to go into our next break. We'll pick it up on the side of break. This is a community conversations. So we got about a, uh, about a uh, eight minute wrap up. So is there any, any particular topic that uh, I have asked you about that you may want to go into on our final segment? Anything else that you may want to get out there that NEA Baptist has going on? Uh, no, I think you've asked really good questions um, and have been pretty thorough. I'm trying to think if there's anything else that we should hit on. Uh, as you know, our focus has been this pandemic. Uh, I guess the, the other thing that I would add is, is we got to make sure that people understand that there's no need to delay care that they need, whether that be in an outpatient setting or uh, in the emergency room or in the hospital. People have to continue to take care of themselves and get the health care services they need. Uh, that's one of the feared effects of the pandemic is that people will be fearful of coming to their health care institution to get taken care of and, and thus uh, you know, create a backlog of care uh, for themselves. You know, what, what is the personal effect from a healthcare standpoint on delaying care? And that, that makes sense. Um, and then you may have, have you ran into a situation where people were afraid to come to the hospital because they were afraid of actually contracting it at the hospital? Yeah, I think there's some high risk patients that you know, that they feel like they're doing the right thing by self-isolating and quarantining and limiting their exposure to people. Uh, and that's good, right? That's what we want. Um, but, but you can't do that in exchange for other health issues you have going on. So you still need to try um, to take care of yourself, whether that's in a physician's office or, or other things that you need to do uh, to stay healthy, keeping a strong immune system and caring for your other health ailments uh, is a particularly important element of protecting yourself from COVID-19. So what are some of the things people can do, you know, to strengthen their health? I mean, obviously to prevent getting COVID, there's the mask and the social distancing and the hand washing, but, you know, as far as diet, exercise, supplements, is there anything else that, you know, a person can do just to try to at least make sure that their health is as optimum as possible to have the best chance of us surviving if they were to contract it. Yeah, well, I, I, if we can just talk about it on a broad scale, you know, my dad always talked to me about making sure I had balance physically, mentally, and spiritually. I, I think all of those are important, uh, not just in the fight against COVID, but overall during the, uh, the period of the pandemic. So from a physical standpoint, yeah, of course, diet and exercise are key. Uh, you know, balanced eating uh, is a battle that we all face. Getting ready to go. Getting ready to go back on. So that, yeah. that might be a good talking point when we sure. go back on the radio, which will be in about uh, now. And we're back on community conversations. We are wrapping up our segment with Sam Lind, the CEO of NEA Baptist Hospital. Been having a great lively discussion on our Facebook live feed. He was actually. I'd actually asked him, what are some of the things that people can do to 
stay healthy to increase their chances of better uh, dealing with COVID-19, along things such as diet and exercise. So I'll just kind of let you pick back up there for those uh, who are now just tuning in on the radio. Yeah, sure. So like I mentioned to our friends on Facebook, uh, you know, my dad always talked about finding balance physically, mentally, and spiritually. And I think those are things that, that we've all got to stay focused on uh, throughout this pandemic process. So, so physically, certainly uh, important from a diet and exercise standpoint to try to eat as balanced as possible uh, and, and try to find opportunities to get exercise. I was at Craighead Park twice this weekend. I know there was quite a few people out there, but people were doing a good job of, of staying pretty distance for the most part and getting some exercise and getting some fresh air. Uh, you know, mentally, certainly you got to find ways uh, to connect with people, uh, stimulate your mind and, and not get lost on, on TV news and social media all day long. So, you know, everybody's got to find a way to do that. And then spiritually, of course, you know, the, the landscape for how we connect with our uh, with the various ministries we're all involved in looks very different today, but continues to be an important part of life uh, for, for all of us across the community. And so I I'd encourage people to really try to focus on finding that balance physically, mentally, and spiritually, uh, to not just combat the virus itself, but to combat all the other effects of uh, that this pandemic's had on all of us. I got a couple more Facebook shout out to Dorothy Kimball and Ashley Garrett, who says, hello, everyone. Well, hello, Ashley. Appreciate you for checking in. So you had mentioned also when we were on the Facebook Live, when we went to break about how people should not delay their care. Um, that if they need something, they should come on into the hospital. So let's kind of talk about that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you bringing that back up. I think that one of the big fears that we have as healthcare providers is that people either out of fear of, uh, of coming in contact with somebody with COVID-19 or otherwise that they might be delaying uh, you know, getting the care they need. And so while we applaud people for uh, the self-isolating and the quarantining and reducing the risk to, of exposure as much as possible, it's also important to not do that uh, and sacrifice the other needs that you have from a healthcare perspective. So, uh, you know, what I would say, I, I'd point to that early study that we had when we tested 1,700 of our 2,000 employees and we saw that you know, less than half a percent, um, you know, tested positive. The, the PPE and the processes and the guidelines that we have for caring for patients is working. And so we think, you know, we're a much safer place uh, than probably Walmart and a number of grocery stores and other places in the community you could go. And so there's absolutely no reason if you're feeling ill or battling a chronic illness, uh, please, please, please do not delay seeking the care you need, whether that's in a doctor's office at one of our several locations, uh, or whether that's in the emergency room in an emergent situation, uh, or even the hospital situation. You know, there are some things that are elective and can wait, uh, but please, please take that advice uh, from a doctor or a provider uh, and make sure you get yourself taken care of. All right, so I want to ask this question. Um, how, how vital has it been having the NYIT Medical School at A-State been to NEA Baptist, especially in battling this pandemic? Yeah, NYIT is a great partner, right? I mean, we're very lucky as a community to have a college of medicine uh, within our town here. Uh, Dr. Spites, who's the dean there, uh, is an excellent leader. He has really helped the Coalition of Northeast Arkansas Hospitals uh, stay up to date on research and trends and data that we're seeing. Uh, and so they've been helpful to us and getting, getting that information to us and helping us make decisions based on uh, the scientific evidence that's out there. Uh, and certainly, you know, having a college of medicine that continues to provide physician talent to our community uh, is such an advantage. And so, you know, we have a num number of their graduates uh, as residents in our internal medicine program, uh, and they're all great students and uh, and great positions uh, that continue to be a resource for us even through even through the pandemic. All right, got a quick question. This comes from Sean Only. She says, I joined in late. Is free testing still being offered for COVID and what is the criteria for getting tested? 
Yeah, so I think the, I think the Department of Health uh, in Craighead County is doing some free testing still uh, in other counties around if you're living somewhere else. Uh, and so they're able to do that for you. Uh, I, I'll have uh, some info, go to the NEA Baptist Facebook on that. Uh, I think they published some information this week and we'll try to get that out. I, I know that they were working on some additional dates for that uh, and we'll, we'll share that information. All right, we got about a minute and a half left. Any final comments that you want to say to our listeners and viewers? Well, I would just say thank you again, for helping us continue to get the message out. Uh, you know, this thing is far from over uh, and we're all tired. Uh, but I think anybody that's in the business world or, or uh, manages their own performance knows that discipline comes far before motivation. And I think for a lot of people, the motivation has fallen by the wayside. Uh, and so we've got to dig down deep and find the discipline to continue to do the right thing to, to care for ourselves and care for each other uh, and help Jonesboro uh, keep on track and, and rebuild the momentum uh, that we know this community can have. All right. Well, Sam, we want to thank you so much for um, stopping by and taking time out of your business schedule to speak to our listeners and our viewers. So, again, just take care of yourselves and each other. Wear your mask, do your social distancing, wash your hands. Look out for those, protect yourselves, and protect each other. We're going to go ahead and get up off, off of here, but you guys have a great and blessed day. This is Kate, L-E-K, -K, 2.5 FM. So I'm stopping the live stream, and I'm stopping it on here, and stopping.